so we come to our third and final uh, lecture, uh, address, talk, uh, on the future of the National Church, question mark. And I think the aim is uh, for David to talk to us for about 40, 45 minutes, and then really to open up a plenary in which he's very willing to take questions on anything relating to any of the three talks. Um, and we've got evening prayer at uh, half past six, and we will need um, a little bit of a break before that. So we might aim to bring the whole thing, uh, so an hour and a half would give us till six o'clock. Um, so let's, let's have six o'clock as a sort of um, end point if, if, uh, if we haven't run out of steam before then. So, um, uh, as usual, with great joy, um, pin back ears, pay attention, pencils down, uh, and uh, time to listen to David again. Your Excellency, um, gentlemen, what I want to begin by doing is again establishing principles rather than talking in detail. In other words, what you need to have the concept of a national church and why it is, in some ways, a peculiarly, not entirely, but a very strongly English development. And it seems to me the reasons for this are once again, and I apologize for my Henrician obsession, they are rooted very firmly in the first half of the 16th century. And they also address our present concerns in a very remarkable way, as so much, I think, of the discussion that we're doing, because the opposite of an idea of a national church depends on a notion of internationalism or anti nationalism. In other words, very much in the current wake of the current world of international liberalism and woke. It seems to me there's an extraordinary echo across time, as we've seen so often in these debates. So let's ask then the question, why was it, and this is also another way of addressing the issue, why was Henry able to get away with it? I was offering you this morning and yesterday a, a rather um, a kind of weaselly way in which he got away with it. You know, the gently, gently kiddie baby. Uh, nothing, too, no, nothing too dramatic happens at once. Um, uh, you never tread on everybody's toes simultaneously. But there is another way in which you can approach this, that England, I think, sees a remarkably important debate about the whether the state has moral authority in the 16th century. Because it seems to me, if you are to have the idea of a national church, the nation and the state in which that church is rooted must be seen to have moral value. Now, this cuts immediately to the heart of both a contemporary debate, the debate on whether nationalism is a good or a bad thing, the whole intensely internationalist notion of uh, intellectual development from 1945 onwards, um, uh, in, in the idea of we have an ambassador here, the whole, the, whole, the whole ethos of the diplomatic service and of Western diplomacy has become essentially one rooted in rubis, the notion of a world order with world values, which of course is a parallel when you come to think of it, of a notion of a universal church. What is it in England that differs? Because I think something does differ, and that our relationship with Rubis is an awkward one in a historical context. Let's then go back, and let's begin. I was teased, I hope, this morning on the subject of Erasmus. And the, the Erasmus seen generally as this wonderful figure of reason, intelligence, rationality, all sorts of things, I have rather mocked, uh, derided him as a too close example of us, a don out of time. I want to look at that other sanctified figure of the period, Thomas More. And I want to look now not at the late Thomas More, not Thomas More the martyr, I, though he will come into it. I want to look at Thomas More of Utopia. And I want to look at the extraordinary clutch of works that More writes in the period of his 
closest relationship with Erasmus, Erasmus, as I said, is this is the period of the First French War, um, from about 1512 through to 1516. Much of the time, Erasmus is here, and uh, Moore and Erasmus are operating the closest friendship, the exchange of, of I, really the, the exchange of ideas and whatever. When um, <coughs> um, Erasmus is summoned to England after the accession of Henry VIII, it's by the man that I was talking about, uh, Lord, Lord Mountjoy, uh, Henry's Socius Studiorum. Uh, he's summoned to England in a famous letter in which it's explained that Henry VIII is not like his money-grubbing father. He believes in, what is it, what is it? virtue, immortality, greatness, virtue, and immortality. Right, so uh, he's summoned into this, this, this world of, a, of a, where it's imagined that large amounts of money will flow. They don't, actually, but that's another, <laughs> that's another matter. Um, uh, and he, he, on his way back from Rome, um, where he's been in Rome, um, Erasmus writes The Praise of Folly, this extraordinary work dedicated to more, which is the thing that takes you into the heart of Erasmus. Because what it is, it is an exercise of sublime contempt for the whole of late medieval culture, which is seen as corrupt, superficial, diverting, the, the worship of gold, the worship of, of fine clothes, the worship of fashion, uh, reverence for people simply because they've got blood and so on. This, the whole of con- war, the whole of contemporary custom is folly as opposed to what should be the pursuit of truth, Christ, and all the rest of it. Now, that, I think, immediately establishes the world of Erasmus and Moore at this point. Moore's response to that is to write two works. We think of them as being very different. They're actually very closely related to each other. That is the history of Richard III, on the one hand, and the other is Utopia. The two works, I think... One of them we think of as a history, the source of Shakespeare's history play, and indeed it is rather good history, more because of his, the fact that he's brought up by John Morton, by Cardinal Morton, and I think has very powerful Yorkist background and collect, co- connections. He writes an elegy uh, for the death of Elizabeth of York and so on, which is clearly written out of personal feeling. We don't know why, but he acts as a... Di- in other words, his, he is a direct conduit to a historical tradition. He's writing in the next generation but one to the actual events of 1483, 1485, which is why it's so valuable. But actually, that's not how he conceives it. That's how it comes down to us, particularly in its English translation. Remember, Moore at this stage does not usually write in English. The first draft, as we now know, uh, of uh, the history of Richard III is an elegant Latin essay, which, when he tries to translate it into English, turns into a sprawling English chronicle, and he gives up. What is the Latin essay about? The Latin essay is essentially, I think, saying that the history of England, a little, this is a bit like Voltaire, you know, history is a catalogue of the sins, follies, and whatever of mankind. It's essentially saying that English history cannot be a source of moral value. He takes this reign and he looks at the spectacular level of immorality, of corruption, of violence, and whatever, and it serves as a kind of illustrative text of this idea. So that's one half of the diptych. What is the other half of the diptych? The other half of the diptych is Utopia, which established, which is in, is, Utopia, as you all know, means nowhere. What he is saying is, and he presents in Utopia, a state which he thinks exemplifies Christian values, but of course is A, unchristian, and B, does not exist. So the real world is an anti-Christian world that worships money, gold, violence. The unreal world is a world... Again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the detail of utopia. Utopia is fundamentally a satire on England. Really important one understands this. And you, you, you get those long sections in utopia on the subject of the absurdity of gold chains. 
Jews, and that in Utopia they bind criminals with fetters made of gold to express their contempt. Everybody, including Henry himself, is loaded down with gold chains. The standard way in which you signify your signature. Look at Thomas More, that enormous thing round his neck, the SS collar, uh, which is the, the livery chain of the House of Lancaster, with the great badge of the, the two, two, two portcullises for Beaufort, and the great Tudor Rose pen. Everybody was loaded in these things. So, and again, there's that marvellous section uh, in which they discuss hanging. Um, the English are inordinately fond of hanging. Virtually every crime is punished by hanging. And it's regarded as being a very good thing, good for the moral fibre, you know, and, and, and whatever. So you get then this separation between a real world of folly and false values and an unreal, unchristian, in the sense of not worshipping Christ, nevertheless exemplifying what should be Christian values. What's in the background? What text of all time is in the background? St. Augustine's City of God. Um, we know more lectures on this, and the St. Augustine's City of God is the key text in this regard. Because what Augustine is doing in that is taking the Roman inheritance. Remember, Rome worshipped itself. You worship Capitoline Jupiter, Jupiter of the Capitoline. In Athens, you worship Pallas Athene, the goddess of the city. It is why, of course, Christianity is such a standing offence. It's not simply the worship of the emperor. The emperor is, the, is, is one of the incarnations of the place, if you want to use nation, state, whatever. And to refuse worship of that is to put yourself outside the community. And what Augustine does, remember, Augustine writes in the wake of 410. He writes in the immediate wake of the first fall of Rome to the barbarians. And he is saying this is not a tragedy. Again, he's saying this is not the fault of Christians. And even if it were, if you remember, a, a, a one very good explanation, uh, I'm afraid, um, is that of Gibbon, that the Roman values of courage, force, and determined uh, seizure of anybody's property in the name of the Roman state, in other words, behaving exactly as Britain did in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, is then undercut by this strange religion known as Christianity, A.K. Woke, um, which disapproves of all of those things, that you have a kind of internal moral revolution. Uh, and what the specific target of Augustine is one of the greatest works of Cicero, which is unfortunately only half surviving and was only fully rediscovered at the beginning of the 19th century, the dialogue De Republica, which was known only in fragments in the Middle Ages, the famous dream of Scipio, uh, which is one of the first things that Chaucer writes about at the very beginning of the process uh, of the Renaissance and all the rest of it. And the De, what the De Republica is, is the justification of the Roman state as a just state, a state which embodies human justice and commands moral authority, and that he is worthy of the educated man, trained in rhetoric, trained... In, well, of course, remember, he understands rhetoric in the good sense of the term, not pulling wool over people's eyes, but the pursuit of truth and the pursuit of politics through two-sided debate. That, that is, and do we, all, we do all understand this, don't we, that the figure behind everybody I've been talking about is Cicero. The, the, the Ciceronian Latin and the notion of, de, of debate, of, of, a, of an entire culture whose fundamental purpose, and again we need to get this right, is in, the entire culture of Rome is a political culture. It is directed to the state and the service of the state in which all forms of knowledge, Philosophy, art, architecture, everything else is there to glorify, to serve, to develop, to make proper, more profound the relationship between the citizen and the republic. The citizen is the republic, the republic is the citizen, the two are in this dialogue with each other. This idea, this idea of, a and remember this is an idea of state service that is very different from that of fealty in a monarchy. It's very different 
than that idea of, uh, of simple, simple personal allegiance. It requires a notion of the existence of the state as separate from that of the monarch. In France, these ideas find it very difficult to take root because you have, by this point, and quite some time, a notion of an absolute monarchy in which Louis XIV can say without irony, as we all know, l'état c'est moi. And what's very striking, for example, in France, it, we find it very difficult to develop the concept of the hero, talking about the notion of nation, national church. In other words, in France, you do not have, before Napoleon, a Westminster Abbey, or you do not have a St. Paul's Cathedral. The idea of the, or the citizen, usually an army or navy officer, but, but clearly sometimes as in, as, in, as in Westminster Abbey, distinguished in the arts, distinguished in mathematics. You know, there is a, you, we all know this, do we? There's a huge monument to Newton in Westminster Abbey. One half of the screen, uh, which is by Hawksmoor, who is also responsible for finishing the West Front, is, is, is a vast monument to Newton. The other one is, is, is to Stanhope, um, the, the great rival of, 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 of Robert Walpole. Uh, and, and you're already, by this point, creating a deliberate national Valhalla within a Christian church, with the notion, of course, that there is a broader sense of service than merely serving the king. They are serving the kingdom. They're serving what what is the word we use in English? Commonwealth. You are serving the commonwealth or the common wheel. And what you can see very strongly, beginning very hesitantly with Chaucer. Remember, Chaucer has the experience. All of this is pioneered uh, in Europe uh, in the Italian city-states, which are themselves republics. So this idea is naturally picked up by them. But of course, those republics all die. Remember, uh, apart from Venice, uh, uh, oh, and, and, and Rimini, <laughs> preposterous, little, preposterous little place. And remember, when the Americans come to try to invent their commonwealth, commonwealth of Virginia, their republic, they are profoundly aware of the failure of these Italian states. And so much of the American constitution is deliberately designed to avoid their errors. Right. Why is it easier for this to come into England? Why does, the, why does Chaucer respond to it? Well, Chaucer, Chaucer responds to it in a very funny way. I've said he reads The Dream of Scipio. Do you know what he does? He goes to sleep, as I notice many of you are doing. You know, he's, 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 he's tired, uh, and he nods off, and he writes. Uh, the, the Dream of Scipio um, is all about the service of the state, and, and you know, uh, uh, Scipio is a great general. I think, aren't we supposed here to be by his tomb? Isn't this one of the, isn't the, the alleged consular monument here? One of the guesses is it's Scipio Africanus, you know, the, the, the man who finally sorts out Hannibal and all the rest of it. Um, uh, uh, so what again, once again, this extraordinary echo of space. Anyway, Chaucer dozes off, but he recognises immediately what he's reading. He realises that there's something in England that corresponds to what um, uh, the dream of Scipio about. It's a thing called Parliament. But in his dream, he transmutes it from a dream about the House of Commons and Laws, which he clearly thinks is as boring as we do, and indeed as boring as King Charles does, which is why he's dropping them from his coronation. Um, he dreams instead of a parliament inhabited by birds who were debating love. And so it's called the Parliament of Fowls. But it's this extraordinary first encounter with the world of the Renaissance, the world of this idea of commonwealth and whatever. And then in the course of the 15th century, and remember, it's very important we understand this, English is a new language. English does not, in our sense, go back beyond Chaucer. One of the great debates which we have uh, in, the, in the reign of Henry VIII, and particularly Gardner, um, a man of the utmost brilliance, I think, but regularly, regu regularly dismissed and forgotten. Gardner, it, one of the fundamental reasons that Gardner objects to the use of English rather than Latin is that it's not a fixed language. English is undergoing this gigantic change. Mostly importantly, in the course of the 16th century, the importation of a vast accumulated voc vocabulary of Latin and Greek English vocabulary nearly doubles in the 16th century. 
It's quite extraordinary. The reason, again, Thomas More can't finish his translation of Richard III is that there were no very few abstract nouns in early 16th century English. So he wants to do the classic thing that you're a good writer. Me do. And you, you begin with a general statement and then you want particular, but you need an abstract noun. So one of the things that he wants to say about Richard, which is picked up so magnificently by Shakespeare, is the idea of Richard as an actor. And he, he says in the Latin, Richard, was a th- Richard III was a man who could play any role. Anyway, he could laugh with, with, laugh with the merry, weep with, with the whatever. The trouble is, English doesn't yet have the word role. So that he can't translate it. Other people do the translation. Moore does not translate Utopia. Um, and you can see from his own English writing how clumsy it still is. The English, but what we now know, of course, is that English is going to undergo Tyndale. It's going to under, un, uh, 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 most wonderful prose, that muscular prose of the New Testament. It's going to undergo Cranmer, the magnificent prose the prayer book, but you can equally see how rapidly they are changing and the marvellous revelation of Shakespeare. So English then is this new language, but now a vehicle for new ideas. And you can see the word commonwealth creep in to English, in the, in, particularly in the course of the struggles of the 15th century. Now, why is, why is this word able to domesticate itself? Well, I've given you, I think, the answer. It's called Parliament. Because when we come to celebrate the coronation, the coronation, you lot are all interested in the business of consecration. There are two aspects to it, however. The first is contract. Before the king gets anywhere near you lot pouring oils on him, he's got to swear oaths. And those oaths are sworn not to the church but to the people. They may be administered by the archbishop, but they are oaths which, are, again, they have been diluted in the 20th century, but the first oath that he swears, and, sh- and I think it would be a very good thing if he actually went back to the original text, we can discuss why it's changed in the course of questions, the first oath from 1689 onwards is to rule by the laws established by Parliament. That's the commitment. In other words, an authority which includes the king but is above the king. This is explicitly stated. Even more interestingly, the germ of that idea is there from 1308, from the beginning of the reign of Edward II. And the development of Parliament is unique in European history. Again, we need to get this straight. Very many European states have estates and representative assemblies of one form or another. They nearly all die out. The English Parliament is not new, it's old. It's not an innovation. It is, an, this will not surprise anybody, an anachronistic survival. You've got to ask why England didn't modernise, like France and Germany and Italy, and become an efficient absolutist state, as Xi or whatever he's called is trying to do in China, as you know, Erdogan is doing in Turkey. It's all sensible, you know, possibly even Biden trying to do a little bit of in America. All sensible governments, as we now know, do. It's so much more efficient. You know. none, none, none of this poncing around with consent and struggling to get two inches of railway built when China has covered the place you know, in high-speed rail in ten minutes. We have this quaint notion. There's a thing called called the consent of the community. And this is absolutely deep-rooted. The oath that Edward had to swear in 1308 is that he will rule according to the laws which a future perfect shall have been chosen by your people. It's a commitment to futurity, to a king that is not just swearing to a vague inherited body of law, but to a living institution, a living law-giving institution. Why does it bind? It binds as the judges are already telling people when they complain they don't want to pay their tax because they haven't voted for it in Parliament. The judges sort of pull the equivalent of their medieval spectacles down and say, oh yes, you were in Parliament because it is legal doctrine that everybody in England is represented in Parliament either in person in the lords, the bishops, the abbots, the peers, or by his representative, of course I'm afraid it is his, and the non-inclusive his, uh, the, 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 uh, in the House of Commons where every community in England in one form or another uh, is represented. So what England develops 
partly, th- I think, centrally through Parliament, is this notion that the, that the king is the head of the Commonwealth, but he is not the Commonwealth, that it exists a- alongside and with an increasing sense above. This seems to me to be an absolute fundamental. Another reason for that development is the extraordinary nature of English common law. English common law, which establishes right back going to the 12th century notion, and clearly associated with Magna Carta, but also legal theorists like Bracton, notions that law, that like, like the fact that there is a rule of law. I, mean, I was pointing out Henry VIII cannot just execute people. And doesn't. You have to go through the form of trial. It may be rigged. You've seen plenty of rigged trials um, in, in various directions. It's very expensive to do. It can be awfully inconvenient if it goes wrong. But you've got to go through the process. And the process is one that respects rules. Similarly, I pointed out Henry VIII respects everybody's property but that of the monasteries. I mean, to the last penny of debt that the monasteries had incurred, the last contract, the last detail of every sheep that they had agreed, you know, to, to hire out, buy in or whatever, that is honoured. And it's honoured to the absolute. So in other words, these notions which everybody, which all economists talk about now, that the essential foundations of prosperity and economic growth are a legal system, a rule of law, and, an, uh, 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 and confidence about property, the whole Hong Kong debate and whatever, is already established and rooted in late medieval England. And the English know it. And they know that's what distinguishes them from continental government, and you already get it in, in Fortescue's um, uh, 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 the governance of England, in which he makes a distinction between two different kinds of monarchy. He makes a distinction between the absolute monarchy of France on the one hand, and what he calls, the, he calls it a dominion, France is a dominium regale, a merely royal monarchy, and there are, there are institutions of, cons- of consent in France, but they're all local. And the king can just play them off against each other. And they're socially based, and he can just play them off against each other. And they do. Whereas um, in England, there is this single general institution and the single body of law, which again, I, I referred to the institutional peculiarity of Parliament, that it meets in a fixed place. It has continuous records, continuous procedure, and so on. English common law is even more remarkable because it has its own educational system, the Inns of Court, which stand in parallel to the two universities of Oxford and Cambridge, which means, again, that much of the Reformation that we talk about under the reign of Henry VIII is a war of two literate elites. It's a war of two sets of lawyers, Canon lawyers, whose ultimate authority is Rome and is universal, the universal church, and English common lawyers, whose authority is rooted in the state and the king and is local and specific and rises from the soil, and we know who wins. So, it seems to me then that what the English spot very, very quickly is that you can do a direct parallel between Roman Republican ideology and that of England. And another reason why I've been talking so much about the popularity of North Italy as a place to study, and particularly I'm emphasizing Bologna and Padua, you will all know how close these are to Venice. The Venetian Republic, again, acts as a model of this. And it, 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 it is written about by its own citizens, and more particularly by the great, by the great Cardinal Contarini. Contarini actually writes um, a praise of Venice, which is directly modelled on what they all think, and they guess very, very shrewdly. Because, by the way, one of the reasons that you actually know a, a lot about the De Repubblica, even though the text didn't, well, it was only partially found as a palimpsest uh, in the... Um, in the early 19th century. One of the reasons you know so much about it, and so tantalizingly, is that Cicero discusses it extensively in the letters to Atticus. So you have, it's astonishing, you have this account of the actual writing of this book, and you, this chapter went really well. I had absolute fun doing this one. This one was a little bit difficult, so they, they know about it. And what Contorini does, he writes a new version of the De Repubblica, the De Repubblica Venetorum of the the Republic of the Venetians, 
not of, not of the Romans. Right. How does that work out in England? Thomas More then publishes Utopia, this vision of an other world that is, that is a kind of anti-world. That's what Utopia is, it's an anti-world, which is a standing indictment of England in particular. Because More's argument, again, it's taken directly from St. Augustine, is that what does the word commonwealth mean? The word commonwealth means, doesn't it, that things are in common. It cannot be a hierarchical society like England. With, I mean, you see my, the, the reason for my sense of modern parallels? You can't have vast, vast disparities of wealth, can we? We, 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 need, we need equality, or we need equity, or we need levelling, or we should be profoundly shocked at the existence of the poor. Uh, all of that is built in the more attack. How does it go in 1516? How does it go in terms of response? One of the most... Utopia is a fascinating book because clearly everybody, it's, it's one of the world's great books, right? How many people give the world an idea, that of utopia? You know, what we've got to remember, gentlemen, is every idea has got to be invented. They just don't exist in the Empyrean. Somebody comes up with these great ideas and they're attached to specific moments and they arise because of specific moments. Clearly, with Utopia, the alternative societies of the New World, as well as the engagement uh, with, 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 with the City of God and so on. But what we have with, with Utopia, you can see it's a text that everybody reads and everybody thinks, God, that's important, but I don't agree with it. I'm going to argue against it. It's one of those texts which triggers the most extraordinary debate. And the debate begins, fascinatingly, within, what is it, 1516... It's within, where are we, 10, within 16 years. In 1532, I mentioned this morning uh, the whole business of, Cas indeed yesterday as well, Castiglione, the idea, uh, the much more important educational idea than, 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 uh, uh, than Erasmus, the idea of the scholar and gentleman, the, uh, the, the one, again, the Roman idea. If I use the word armata and togata, does anybody have a sense? Romans are represented in one of two ways. You're either draped in the toga, which is how you are as a, civil, as a, a citizen in civil life, or you're wearing armour as the citizen at war. So it's the two faces, war and peace, each being regarded as the duty of the citizen in a republic. Right? The, again, why you have the clause about the bearing of weapons in the American Constitution? It is a, so these are, this is the tradition they are, this is the tradition that they are writing in. Anyway, um, uh, what, you, what you get after, uh, and again, it's also rooted in rhetoric and persuasion. Uh, Castiglione's idea is that you need to train a gentleman exactly as the public schools came to do, on the one hand in the classics, and then on the other hand in all the gentlemanly arts, of course, including music, including, uh, including sport, um, including writing a verse, whatever, and a, the primary purpose being to train you to give good counsel to the prince, to be able to, to get his confidence so that you could tell him the truth about all he needs to know without fear of offending him and whatever. I mean, that's the, th that's the theory. In fact, you read, you, you read the book of the courtier in exactly the same way, for exactly the same reasons that you read PPE when you go to Oxford, because you're a little shit and you aspire to power. You know, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> That's why you do, isn't it? That's why you do, of course. That's, you look, look at its products. Look at Matt Hancock, you know, if, if, you want, if, you, if you want to see the truth of this horrible degree. Uh, and indeed, David Cameron. Uh, I mean, the, there's a kind of oleag oleaginous quality, a kind of faint sense of stickiness uh, that, go, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, of course, Mandelson as well, um, and the, 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 archety the archetypical sort of slug. Um, the, 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 um, so the, the, there is then the, the idea of, of, of the rhetoric, rhetoric applied to all of this um, and, and a vast educational programme. It is picked up, 1528 it goes into print, it is picked up within four years. Oh, by the way, it's Cromwell's favourite book. It's the book that Cromwell recommends. This is not Machiavelli. It's a book, this is complete misunderstanding. Machiavelli does not go into print for another decade. Cromwell cannot have read Machiavelli. 
at this stage. We know, in fact, that he sent a copy of Machiavelli after he'd been extremely Machiavellian for nearly 10 years um, <laughs> because Lord Morley sends him a copy. And the, the book that he's discussing with Cardinal Pole is the Book of the Courtier. There's absolutely no doubt about this at all. And we know that he's got friends like Bishop Bonner, the future bloody Bonner, who are very keen to, they call themselves making themselves good Italians. And this is the secular version of that immersion in, that immersion in Italian culture that I was talking about from the point of view of the church um, uh, 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 before. So what you get is then an astonishing response to uh, both the book of the courtier and to utopia. It's written by a man called Sir Thomas Eliot, who is a profound, any of you who are familiar with T.S. Eliot, uh, Eliot the poet uses the book of the courtier in particularly Little Gidding um, uh, as, as the, I mean, he used it in a very odd way. It's in fact a highly sophisticated book. He uses it to represent the plodding of peasants and all the rest of it, but he, he's interested in, in, in the language. But what in fact the book of the courtier is, it's an adaptation into the English context of the educational program of Castiglione. So it's about how you train a gentleman a governor, a gentleman, somebody who will bear rule within the English Commonwealth. Um, and it's, it's um, effectively, it becomes the brief. Earlier this morning, I talked about the fact that with the Reformation, the universities, like everything else, are laicized. And you get the movement of the gentry to the universities. And the book of the courtier, sorry, the, the, the book of the governor, becomes the key to the informal educational program that the gentry undergo there. So it's of extraordinary importance in that sense. But it's of even greater importance in another sense, because what you get at the beginning, although he does not mention Thomas More by name, by the way, Eliot and More are the closest of friends, which becomes profoundly embarrassing to Eliot at certain stages of the 1530s. And he has to write the kind of letters, and again, let's face the horror of Henry's reign, which you have to do under any particularly nasty dictatorship. Uh, a letter in which you dissociate yourself from a friend to save your own life. You know, we, can, we, can, we can smile and whatever, but there are terrible things. Um, but what Eliot also does, he debates with Moore his denial of a, the true commonwealth in England. And he does it in a way which is fascinating. He says, he doesn't mention Moore by name, but it's obvious what he's talking about. He says, you know, some people say that um, uh, you can't have a, that, you know, that, 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 that English, England is not, a, is not a true commonwealth, is not a proper res publica uh, because of this, uh, the fact that uh, uh, commonwealth means everything has got to be held in common. And here you get the real voice of the good side of Erasmus, the real voice of proper linguistic analysis. You get Eliot saying commonwealth is a really bad translation of res publica. Um, he, I mean, he says, if it were to be commonwealth, it would have to be, um, it would have to be the popular thing or the people's thing. That would be the Latin version of it. That instead, this is the public thing. And then he points out that he therefore wants not to translate it as commonweal, but public wheel. And then he goes on to say, well, actually, if you look at ancient Rome, ancient Rome was just like us. It had a fixed legal system. It had representative assemblies. It had tightly structured orders of class. Once it's grown up and got rid of these tiresome things called consuls, it gets a proper monarch, so you know it's nice and nicely monarchical and proper. And he said, we are, in other words, the new Rome. And therefore, our state, like their state, commands moral value. And what you get from that point onwards is an increasing swelling of this idea in 16th century England, and it culminates in the book, which directly echoes both in its title, directly echoes both Cicero, and directly echoes um, Contarini, at the De Republica Anglorum, the Republic of the English, which is written by Sir Thomas Smith, um, in 1569, I think it is, uh, Elizabeth's Secretary of State, who'd also been uh, uh, Secretary, uh, had also been Regis Professor of Greek, God, those were the days, weren't they? Also, also Regis Professor of Greek at Cambridge, and one of the great influences on the education of Sicil and all sorts of people. Anyway, what Thomas Smith does is in that is to say he directly counters more. 
he uses the arguments uh, of Eliot and he says, we, I do not wish, concludes the thing, I do not wish to write about imaginary commonwealths like St. St. Augustine, like Plato, like Sir Thomas More. I want to write about the state of England as it is now. And he gives the date under the whatever year it is of Queen Elizabeth I. And I want to argue that we are as good, as just, and as well-ordered a commonwealth as any that has ever existed. And I think it's this sense of the independent moral value of the state which then able, enables, powers the development of the idea of a national church. Because, of course, that extraordinary, that extraordinary irrationality of the Henrician settlement that I talked about with the, with the immensely activist role of the supreme governor, uh, in, in the, sorry, of, of the supreme head in the form of Henry, the, Henry VIII himself is increasingly taken over by the machinery of parliament. However much Elizabeth fights against it, however much the Stuart kicks against the pricks of it, until finally, in 1689, religion, like everything else, is determined by this body of the realm. And what I think is very, then very striking is to look at what emerges uh, from, from 1689 and from the extraordinary coronation of William and Mary, uh, which, which follows the Glorious Revolution. How many of you are familiar with the... I mean, one of the things I've been trying to get home is place and the importance of historical place. How many of you are familiar with the painted hall of Greenwich? Right, what does it represent? It's, called the, it's very often called the English Sistine Chapel. What does it represent? Pardon? Yes, it represents... The, it, what it really is, it's the reenactment in this extraordinary Baroque paintwork of English history from 1689 to 1713-14 and the Hanoverian accession at each stage. What does it represent? Well, let me give you the picture because it will help us a lot in what we're talking about. What happens with that coronation of 1689? Um, two things strike... Well, there are the three things about it. There is an act passed for the oath... The coronation oath is completely rewritten. So it's a totally clear statement. You will rule by the laws made in Parliament. You will indeed do justice in mercy and in truth. And your version of Christianity when you're keeping church, uh, peace between church and people will be the reformed religions by Parliament established in England. Right. Those, that becomes the triple oath. What happens in, with that coronation. It's represented, that oath is the complete, as we were, underpinning. They all know what's happened. Westminster, well, there's been all this fuss about who shall be in Westminster Abbey, how many seats will be available. The entire, let me get my geography right, the entire north side of the choir is taken over with a huge gallery in which the entire House of Commons has the very best dressed seats at the coronation, the dress circle, as it were, with their speaker sitting and himself enthroned in the middle, overlooking a king that will swear to obey the laws made in Parliament. And you get a sermon preached by Gilbert Burnett. Are we all familiar with Burnett as the great, the great uh, apologist for the Church of England, uh, uh, the, the great early apologist, and a very scholarly one? Um, that uh, There's part of the great 19th century debates. There are re-editions of Burnett, Burnett because he cites so many documents, many of which were later damaged in the Catonian fire and that sort of thing. But Burnett preaches the sermon, and it's a very remarkable sermon in that it's a wholly political sermon. What it actually says, we are uniquely blessed in England because we do not suffer, on the one hand, from tyrannical or despotic power, gesture to Louis XIV, and on the other hand, we do not suffer from the arbitrary rule of tumultuous multitudes, Oliver Cromwell. And instead, we're here in this perfect middle ground, which is then illustrated by the painted hall, which shows the fruits of conquest, of commerce, of learning, of science, of technology, of art. Every, every, every one of the arts and whatever is represented there as flourishing in this new regime of law, a deed, but law that is English, 
that is specifically rooted here in England and that can only be translated, I would argue, into other similar communities, which is why there are the five eyes, all of which, of course, are derivates from this England that I've been talking about. Now, this seems to me it is impossible to have a vision of a national church unless you actually believe, not that it's perfect, Nobody, they didn't think it, England was a perfect society. What they thought was it was a just society. In other words, it's one that can be administered by due process and in which the idea of improvement is possible. You have to have that as a basic idea, otherwise it's impossible. You will all have different notions about the need for it to be a Christian community and so on, but that's a different matter. I think the reason why this idea anchors itself in England such extraordinary effect and lasts so long and assumes so many different forms, which is now a perfect moment for us to talk about, is this that I've described. You have to have the sense of the moral value of the state. And it is precisely what woke is trying to do at the moment, which is to destroy that value of the state, which is also, by the way, fundamentally historically rooted, which is also what Eliot is on about. Eliot, Eliot has two views of transcendence, which come out very, very clearly. And he, of course, gives the order of the divine transcendence, but Little Gidding is also about historical transcendence. And I, because I'm a non-believer, I attach myself to the notion of historical transcendence, which is why I've been talking to you about place in the way that I do. For me, I feel, and I hope, if you didn't already, that you will begin to get that sense. There is something utterly extraordinary in standing in the Pantheon, or in Westminster Abbey, or in St. Paul's, or in Little Gidding. As, 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 as Eliot says in Little Gidding, history is now in England. You feel that disappearance of time, or rather that you are part of that. Again, it's Burke, the marriage of past, present, and future, that intergenerational bond, which is, I think, the proper basis of a national church, which is why, even though I am not a Christian, I believe in a national church. Thank you. As in a question that demands re re a response, but I think I think the next sentence I want to add is a national church, but what kind? But perhaps uh, perhaps others have been thinking that way. But but thank you for taking us and and uh, history is now in England. Those words were on my lips as you started um, uh, going uh, going deeper into Little Gidding. But but thank you for that uh, wonderful um, uh, journey to, to, to through uh, from from the Tudor and Elizabethan period through on to into um, the, the threshold of, of, of where we are now. Um, so, um, this really is now about um, opening up the conversation, and um, uh, we've, got, we've got plenty of time. So, um, yes. And can you all speak up? I'm sorry, uh, my hearing is not brilliant with this kind of echoey space. Um, um, do you mind? I'm, I'm sorry. It, it, no, I apologise. It seems very rude. Um, in the light of what you said, do you think that uh, both Cicero and um, Thomas More had to be killed for essentially the same reason? <laughs> no, I don't. Well, they had to be killed for opposite reasons. Um, that is to say, um, uh, Cicero believes in a proper form of an earthly commonwealth to which Caesar and Caesar Augustus are opposed and are determined to destroy. But of course, destroy, remember, Augustus does it very much like Henry VIII. You don't call yourself emperor, you call yourself brinkeps. You first family, where have we heard that term before? You know, uh, uh, and you insinuate a monarchy into the folds of a republic, just as Badgett says in the 19th century, though he's very late, that a monarchy has, fi you know, that a republic inserts itself into uh, the folds of, of, of a monarchy in England. By the way, the, the big point that I am making is England is a royal republic. 
and has been a royal republic, I would argue, since the Plantagenets. And it's only comprehensible as such. Now, the killing of Thomas More, you are right. Thomas More disagrees radically with what I've said. If we accept the account uh, of, uh, which again is, it's, it's, we do not have, we do not have direct evidence. We've only got Roper's evidence uh, of his trial. Right. What he, Roper says in his trial is the deliberate repudiation of exactly the point that I've been making. What what he says is, um, uh, you all know, Moore is is is, is trapped uh, uh, by, by Richard Rich into uh, re- uh, an apparent rejection of the supremacy and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, Moore, d- because it, Moore does not believe that he is of a calibre to assume martyrdom. He does everything he can to avoid it, but when finally push comes to shove, he accepts it. And uh, 16th century legal procedure enables you to do this. So more is condemned. Um, uh, 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 the jury... Because he's because he's not a he's not a, he's 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 tried by a commission of Y and Telmine. He's not actually tried by the court of, of the high steward. He's not a nobleman, so there's a, there's a fairly standard procedure. Uh, he's condemned, uh, and the the, the 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 president of the commission of Y and Telmine, the chairman of the commission, Audley, moves immediately to sentence. Moore, of course, is one of the greatest law, English lawyers, as well as this extraordinary polymath. And Moore says, uh, uh, my lord, uh, in my day it was customary that the prisoner was allowed to traverse the verdict. That is to say, you were at that stage allowed to present an argument. And what Moore does is quite, it's, it is totally a wonderful piece of rhetoric if he really did it. He says, my lord, the act of parliament under which I was condemned was illegal. Why is it illegal? Because the English Parliament is only a provincial assembly. The English Parliament is merely the equivalent of the City of London against the Parliament of England because the determination that the Pope is head of the church is a resolution of the entire Commonwealth of Christ the whole body of Christendom, whose assembly is not the English Parliament, but the General Council of the Church, which is only summable, and he's reflecting now, the Council of Constance by the Pope. Therefore, the, the statute under which I have been condemned is illegal. In other words, he is arguing for the, for the unimportance of the nation and the importance of you. In other words, exactly what he's saying in Utopia the importance of universal values. Audley is clearly completely... Can you imagine? You're a judge and the greatest lawyer in England that you amount to you know, tell you know, the horrors of the sentence of, of hanging, drawing and quartering suddenly comes up with this. Audley does. You can see why he gets on so well. He immediately passes the buck. To it, so he turns to the Lord Chief Justice, uh, who is also on the panel of Why and Tell Me Name. Second, could you deal with this one? And the man does not miss a beat. He simply says, if it's an act of parliament, it's good enough. Complete English positivism. And do you know what? When I was present at a debate recently, uh, which is a wonderful book which you all ought to read by Patrick Nash on what's happening to England because of uh, uh, Islamic immigration, but the fact that the, that the very large part of the Pakistani community has got a clan structure which is established by first cousin marriage. It's an astonishing book and one that you know, is really of, 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 of immense importance. And I was expecting that uh, Jonathan would go into a really interesting debate on this. He said, you know what, I think the arguments have absolutely no interest whatever because we judges can do whatever we want. That's a verdict of your dominant member of the Supreme Court. In English law, if the judges think, decide it's law, it's law. Which is exactly, you see what I mean? It's exactly the voice of that Lord Chief Justice at the trial of Moore. But, I mean, you are right. Moore represents, which is why I began with Utopia, really began with Utopia. Moore represents the opposite set of values. As, of course, do the universalist, as does Regnans in Excelsis, as do the universalist claims of the papacy. Which is why, you, know, you sir, represent uh, 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 the, the, the healing process of some of these extraordinary divisions. 
But, but why, why Catholicism was excluded from the throne? Because Catholicism was seen as representing a totally antithetical sense of value. And the other thing that's very important, again, and I've only become aware of this, we've all been having this tremendous debate about England and slavery. Why is it that the anti-slavery movement is so completely English? I think I've now got the answer. The fashionable view is Tom Holland work, dominion and whatever, that Christianity is fundamentally the basis of liberal values. What absolute nonsense. For most of its history, Christianity has been totally happy with absolutism and has survived in it, you know, has an absolute monarchy uh, in the papacy. Um, what is it? Why does this happen? I think it's because the English, as they increasingly consciously differentiate themselves now at a very popular level from Louis XIV with you know, the Second Hundred Years' War, as Churchill talks about it, against the French. You start using the term slave to refer to the subjects of an absolute monarchy, which is why you have Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. You're not thinking of Britain suddenly becoming blacks working in the plantations. You're thinking of them becoming French. With too terrible thought to contemplate. Um, uh, and, and so you see what I mean? The word slave really comes in the language in a way which it, you know, why should it have done? There's no condemnation of slavery in the Bible. St. Paul, you know, merely offers good advice to slaves and slave masters. It, it, it disappears in the sight of God, as do all other human distinctions. But, but there's no condom. Why should there be? And, of course, Roman culture is entirely based on slavery. So, again, once you get this sense of specificity, all sorts of historical puzzles start to solve themselves. Sorry, that was such an interesting question. I went on far too long. I apologise. I'd like to pick you up on your, your last or final comments about you believe in a national church. Is it then time to eradicate the Church of England and call it the Church in England? A church in England. Yes. Uh, well, we, because that would cause on the moral state of the moral church. The, the, the issue would be, the issue would be, wouldn't it, that one of our great problems at the moment, and I think why many of these things are in debate, is that not simply have we lost a sense of a national church or a church or the specificity of Christianity or whatever, we've lost a sense of nationhood or the, the, the notion of nationhood itself, of cultural identity, of our history, all in, in matters of profound contention. So, um, you, I mean, you can argue, I mean, again, talking of alternative forms of a national church, it seems to me to be pretty clear, if you look at what happens to the Church of England after 1689 and that extraordinary moment which is represented by the painted hall in Greenwich, is that the Church of England becomes essentially English Shinto. It's the English worshipping themselves, which in the person of the monarch. I mean, you, you look at the the, the, that royal element in the prayer book, I mean, just the dominance of the idea of king and kingship and whatever, you'd never know really that we had much of a parliament if you just look at the prayer book. You can still hear the voice of Henry VIII and his sense, you know, his, his sense of government uh, 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 there. Uh, but I think it does become English Shinto. Um, that uh, it's not, and it is more than just the Tory party at prayer. And you can also see, you, you can see, I think, very clearly uh, that in the 18th century, this is where you come in, what happens in the 18th century, you abandon the old notion of the royal year, the old year that still, despite Protestantism, rooted in the Christian calendar and whatever, and Handel gives you a totally different musical text for empire and triumph. See the conquering hero comes, becomes a kind of mission statement of of this, 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 this conquering church. Again, you look at St. Paul's. St. Paul's is consciously reinvented as a Valhalla of naval and military heroism, which is why there is this profound uncomfortableness about it now. The, the, you, 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 have you all looked at those monuments, these extraordinary sculptures, gigantic, muscular young men? And you look at them, they've all, they're aged about two and a half, they're aged about 18 or, nine, 18 or 19, and they've done unbelievably heroic things. You know, one young midshipman with a rowboat will have, will have taken a French frigate. 
dies in the process. No, he, there is one of them. He dies in the process. You know, this is real heroism, which, which is consciously sponsored, and it's consciously modelled on the Roman experience. This is duce et decorum est, pro patria mori. That's exactly what it is. Um, and, uh, but done, bizarrely to us, within the context of Christianity. But a Christianity, of course, that attaches itself to the Old Testament and to the military triumph of the Jews. You know, Hail the conquering hero comes, it's Judas Maccabeus. If you, it's, it's particularly the Handel Oratorios. Um, uh, again, I was wakened to so many of these thoughts when I was a, a newly graduated at Cambridge and I was sitting in King's College listening to performance of the Messiah after the fellows of King's in their wisdom decided that the cross obscured the view of the Rubens altarpiece. So you, kept, you removed the, the sole visible Christian symbol uh, there, so you had the Rubens altarpiece, and then you were surrounded. I will, do, you, do you remember the interior of King's where you have these vast Tudor imperial crowns, which John Salk held out the vulgarity to put light bulbs inside? So you... <laughs> You had all of these throbbing symbols of Tudor monarchy, and you know um, the, 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 the Hallelujah chorus, you know, King of Kingdom, Lord of Lords, and He's from Monarchy, 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 monarchy. God simply is a grown-up version of the King of England, and um, uh, and that, but, but seriously, had, this, 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 do we all realise this language is invented? Handel invents this language for the coronation of, of, of George II. It's, it's, it the, in other words, it, the, this use, as we were saying, of what really are outdoor instruments mm -hmm. inside, the wind, the, instruments. the wind instruments and the timpani, this is invented really for Zadok the priest. And it then he then picks it up. You know, he then goes back to writing Italian opera and all the rest of it, completely different musical language, and then he comes back and one of the things that's striking about Handel's musical language is how well you can hear the words. Yes. I mean, the astonishing setting of English. Um, and the way he reduces the text. And the way he reduces the text. You know, again, it's astonishing. George II says to him, um, you can edit the Psalms. The Archbishop of Canterbury is outraged. Handel takes except, the, the original coronation service, the complete texts of all of these Psalms were recited. If you look at the equivalent Purcell setting, the entire text is there. And it goes on for about 45 minutes. Handel cuts it down to three lines. I mean, you can just see his pen going through it. And there it is, you know, zero at the priest, and, and that wonderful rhythm taken up from the words. Um, it's, it's, a story, we, 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 it's so easy, again, to take it for granted. But it's, it's, an, it's a sublime act of creation of a particular moment and a particular culture. Anyone else? I, mean, I think the, what the, the, um, the forward of your question, which I mean, perhaps is in other people's minds, but I'll sort of try and articulate it, is with the... 1689 uh, coronation with the supremacy of Parliament. How does the how does the good of the national church? Um, what bulwark is there left? And we might think about something um, such as um, the state considering mandatory reporting for all um, you know uh, disclosures of um, child sexual abuse or whatever it may be, uh, and the issue of um, sacramental. Fashion. How can there be any remaining bulwark between the state simply dictating to the church? Well, remember, the con seal of confession has never had any existence in common law. I'm sorry. Uh, similarly, there is no notion, um, and it was one of the things that was most deliberately reacted against, there is no notion of sanctuary. Uh, the, the, obviously, there were in the Middle Ages, there were the, there were the great you know, sanctuaries surrounding Westminster Abbey, but there is the profound hostility of common law. Um, and I think it's, it's you know, the, 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 again, the, that extraordinary majoritarian instinct of common law. It is a very, it's very uneasy with any rival. And canon law was seen specifically as a rival. And of course, with the Reformation, the teaching of canon law in the University of Oxford and Cambridge is banned. Uh, and the only way that you can get a, a sort of smell of it if you're educated in England is by reading civil law, 
Roman law, which of course is the root of canon law, but, but without the Christian content. Um, uh, it's, it, it, common, common law is jealous. It's a jealous law. In other words, the behavior of America, that extraordinary aggression of the American legal process derives directly from its roots in England. Isn't you know, the reason that the American Revolution works is that it isn't. That's to say, it tries to do none of the radical things that the French Revolution does. You get no redistribution of property, save people who'd exile themselves as Tories. Uh, you get no, uh, no attempt at legal reform. You, you, you keep English common law, and you continue to keep it because you don't have Victorian legal reform. The, um, the, the, similarly, uh, you keep the existing structures of state government. States already had representative assemblies. And uh, remember, the American Constitution, as Tom Paine points out with bitter indignation to George Washington, is simply the king with a wig rather than a crown. That's what the president is. His powers are directly modelled on that of the late 18th century English monarch. Um, and, and you can see this very clearly if you, if you go to, uh, you, you, look at, you look at Congress, okay, mm -hmm. you've got the language of the, you know, the, the neo-Roman language of Senate and all the rest of it, but the lower house has got a speaker who, as would have been one of the lines of development of the English Parliament, actually manages the House, as John Burko tried to do, and as Speaker Lentil did at the beginning of the Revolution. And the, 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 the person who is the administrative officer of the House of Representatives, well, the Americans haven't the faintest idea who he is. And he's this strange feet creature called a sergeant at arms. And no American has got any idea what a sergeant, a sergeant at arms is, or why he's there. He's just there because there's a sergeant at arms who is the administrative officer of the House of Commons. I mean, there is little, there's as little real revolutionary change as that. You, um, you just cut off the imperial ties and then immediately resume them more aggressively economically. Yes. Can I ask a brief question about um, history as a series of accidents sometimes and the notion of how quickly and how pragmatically certain personalities deal with Henry's legacy? So I think you're somebody who's done a lot of work on when Elizabeth's uh, court has to examine his will and how they get away with the fact... Well, you talk about it. But... Remember, the Stuart succession is illegal. Uh, there's a, there's a really, it's, the Stuart succession is a direct defiance of Act of Parliament. Henry VIII's will, which is ratified by Act of Parliament, outlaws the succession by the descendants of Henry's eldest sister, Queen Margaret, uh, as she becomes Margaret, Queen of Scots, because, she, because those descendants are foreign-born. And instead, Henry's will, backed by statute, gives the succession to the children uh, and descendants of Henry's younger sister, uh, Mary, who becomes successively Queen of France uh, and then uh, Duchess of Suffolk. Uh, being, being married to Charles Brandon. Um, Elizabeth loathes this idea, and of course the Grey family has terribly blotted its copybook in the person of Jane Grey and all the rest of it, so she's absolutely determined that won't happen. But equally, she can't trust Parliament to resolve the succession in a way that they want, so how do they deal with it? There's a very solemn meeting of the Privy Council, and I think it's 1566. They read Henry's will... A large chest is commissioned with two locks. The will is placed and a very remote corner of the Exchequer Treasury of Documents is discovered that's somewhat prone to damp. And you put it there. Not opened again for hundreds of years. And, absolutely, and, and James knows this. James knows that he's succeeded illegally to the English throne, which is why he's able to invoke a ver uh, why he's able to claim that he succeeds by indefeasible hereditary, hereditary right. That uh, is, is Maitland, um, uh, Frederick Maitland, the great, great Cambridge constitutionalist, constitutional medieval historian, who first suggests this idea. I haven't thought of it, but he's obviously right. Obviously right. Sorry, somebody else was... Another hand was raised. Every monarch who has promised to uphold the Protestant reform religion, up until our national queen in 1953, would probably have felt the people out of Parliament have uphold this as well. How do you think the king feels being asked to, to, to uphold that where 
But he's right, really, isn't he? I mean, all that one can say is he's right. Um, and that, that, but the trouble is, it's not clear. The, 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 I mean, remember, the notion of the Protestant Reformed religion uh, as embodied in the Church of England uh, was not, never the simple majority faith. The situation in England very, very quickly with, with the tolerance of dissent on the one hand, the increasingly, practi increasingly practical tolerance of Catholicism and Judaism, their actual admission to civic status, you know, to, to, to being restored to the full rights of citizenship um, uh, you know, in the late 1820s, 1830s and so on, um, the, the, you already have a highly disparate and, um, uh, and, and mosaic-like community. In the same way, there is no nation of Britain. Remember, we are a most peculiar society. Um, Britain, from the very beginning, was multinational. That's what it is. It's a fusion of two separate historic kingdoms, one of which incorporates two other quasi-states, Ireland and Wales. Um, and right from the beginning, this extraordinarily polymorphous nature uh, of the British state is understood. Whereas in France, of course, in the 18th century, was very much more disparate. And there were much more extremes of dialect and all the rest of it. But in France, as in America, you ha you, or indeed in Germany with the Kulturkampf, you, ha you use the new devices of state education to reimpose unity. This is why, remember, the whole notion of laïcité that you have in France only really comes in not directly from, not directly from the First Republic. It's a product of the Third Republic. It's a product, really, of the, of, the, of, the 80, of the 1880s, and particularly the 1890s, and Jean Jaurès, and all the rest of it. But you impose uniformity through education. There was never a uniform educational system in England. There were church schools and there were, and there were, and there were dissenter schools and there were Quaker schools and there were Catholic schools and there was a totally separate educational system in Scotland. And even with union in 1707, even, even with the Act of Union in 1707, being British is for export. You're a Briton abroad and the Scots only agree to union because they can have access to the English Empire, having failed to establish one of their own in the Darien scheme. And then they become, of course, the, as one really must keep on reminding what's left of the Scot Nats, they become outstanding and brutal colonialists. The, the, the entire weight of Canadian Hong Kong banking, uh, the, uh, Hong Kong and Shanks are run by Scots. The whole Canadian banking system, brutal treatment of the native population, Entirely Scottish. They need reminding of this loudly, uh, loudly. Uh, uh, the ambassador can just top his ears uh, 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 at, 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 at this point. But there is no attempt at the real imposition of an internal national unity. Remember, the extraordinary fact that the first football international is, is played between England and Scotland. Um, uh, uh, so, so we, we are very, very peculiar. Do you see what I mean? We've, we've been intensely disparate. I mean, what I think happens is you can see if we, if we, if we, if we, if we jump forward through the Victorian period, you can see a very different way in which church and monarchy relate to each other. Remember, the great cha if you look at from the early 18th century, right through to essentially to Victoria and to the decades of reform of the 1830s, you're dealing with a semi-aristocratic state, essentially, in which you manage, remember, the great, I mentioned this, this, this point before, the great art of the survival of the English parliament is that it's managed. The problem in 1689 was you created effectively two equipolent, equal powers, monarch and parliament. How on earth do you handle relations between them without there being deadlock? The answer is the creation of the office of prime minister, because we've got two monarchs. There's the, there's the nominal monarch, just like the Japanese with the emperor, you, 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 you have the mikado, 
um, who is, his, is our sovereign, not for nothing again, English Shinto, you have the Mikado, and then you have the equivalent of the Shogun, who is the real exerciser of power, who is the Prime Minister. And we are still ruled by the royal prerogative, but it's just exercised by the Prime Minister. But the Prime Minister's got two jobs. He manages the monarch on behalf of Parliament, and he manages Parliament on behalf of the monarch, using all the devices of royal patronage, which unfortunately have become increasingly to the surface, hence the sewer-like smell that no longer comes from the Thames, but actually comes from uh, at the time of Bazalgette, but, uh, but actually comes from inside the house. Um, uh, but, but, the, 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 so, but this aristocratic constitution, of course, um, again shows unique flexibility. This is another reason for taking very seriously those claims about the moral value of the English state. The English state is the only great state of the 19th century that does not collapse with revolution, that is capable of absorbing democracy. When you get people marching in the streets in England with the Chartists and whatever, they're not saying tear down Parliament, they're saying we want to vote, we want a seat. So that legitimacy continues. But of course, once you've actually con started to concede the vote to the unwashed, the nature, you know, with, with 1867, with by, of course, it's really. Uh, once you've conceded the vote to the unwashed, you then have the problem of how you manage the electorate. And this is the moment at which there's a transformation in the role of monarchy, very much in harness with the church. I mean, if you look at the, the early 20th century coronations, which provided the blueprint, which really culminates in 1953, they're a product of two thoughts. They're a product of the one hand of the need to represent government through an individual or through a person to this new popular electorate. And you do it very much, just as you'd done in the Middle Ages, by royal ceremony. You reinvent royal ceremony in the first decades of the 20th century. And it's principally the work of a man called uh, uh, Reginald Brett, Viscount Isher, um, who is the, uh, the, the, the chairman of the Committee on Imperial Defence and the, the, the constable of Windsor Castle and the great court favourite of Edward VII. And it's done in two ways. You re-ceremonialise the coronations, which would become absolutely shambolic with Victoria. And it's a result of astonishing scholarship. The, the, current, the research into medieval history that's done in that first decade of the 20th century is of spectacular quality. And it's, this is the moment at which you, for the first time since Handel, you've great coronation music written, you've got Parry, you've, 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 you, 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 you've got Elgar, and all, 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 all the rest, and, you know, right up to Crown Imperial and all the rest of it for, for the coronation of the Queen. Um, uh, you don't get, sadly, the same corresponding excellence in the research on the um, church's robes, do you? They get a little bit of, they're told, isn't it one of them that's told, um, go and find your best clothes? Oh, oh well, that's because Edward VII is pig ignorant. But, the, but this is, the, 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 the very striking thing is, this is the moment at which high church becomes acceptable. Rem be, not, not because the monarchy believes in it, but because, as I've been very usefully reminded by Daniel, um, Edward VII wants a good show. So remember, co do we all understand this? That what you were wearing would have led to your being burned, I think, in, in earlier in the 20th century. Um, the, the, the use of even the cope was regarded as exotic and dangerous. The first time that a mitre is worn is at the enthronement of Cosmo Gordon Lang as Archbishop of York in the middle of the First World War. I mean, the, 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 but why it becomes acceptable is because they wanted magnificence. They want, theat again, going back to that word, they want theatrical splendor. And the great works of the medieval coronation service provide wonderful theatrical splendor. But what you also do is you reconstruct the center of London as a theater of monarchy. The, the, uh, the monument to Victoria, which had been conceived of as a simple monument to Victoria, is taken over by the genius of Isha, and he redesigns the mall. The entire mall is conceived as a royal theater. From the, from the Admiralty Arch uh, right down the length of the Mall to that extraordinary roundabout 
with all the gates named after the, 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 the great dominions of empire, Australia, Canada, uh, uh, South Africa, and whatever, the great gates there. And when it was explained to the royal princesses this thing was going to be, uh, going to be constructed, they say, oh dear, aren't the people getting a little close? To which uh, Isha responds, that's the idea. And then, because there's a bit of money lift, left over, you, you, put a, you glue a new front on Buckingham Palace in the course of the summer months of 1913. You don't even take the window panes out. It's, the, it's one stone thick, glued on, and you create this huge balcony in the centre for the triumph. And so you're creating, you're creating a theatre of spectacle to a, mon to, to a, an, a very critical audience. Remember, uh, London is the site of the great variety of theatres, things like the Colosseum and whatever. They're used to spectacular theatrical performance, and the monarchy with the church clothing it becomes part of this. And then again, it's taken over, uh, and it's really very important to acknowledge this, it's taken over by Cosmo Gordon Lang as a central part of the struggle against divorce law reform. The church and the monarchy, this is how you invent the idea of the family monarchy and the notion that the idea of divorce and being king of England is absolutely impossible. There's, of course, nothing whatever in law that says this at all. Otherwise, as we all know, Henry VIII would have had the odd problem. Um, uh, but, but it's used to get rid of Edward VII. I mean, it's, everybody thought, I mean, even the prime minister thought at the time of the abdication crisis that there was a rule which said the monarch could not you know, marry a divorced person or be divorced or whatever and there's this appalling letter there's this appalled letter from the Lord Chancellor saying unfortunately this isn't true so we've got to come up with some other means of getting rid of it uh, um, but the, the monarchy is deployed and I, I think it, the family monarchy that elevation of George V uh, uh, and Queen Mary uh, George VI and Queen Elizabeth and the earlier part of the reign of Queen Elizabeth herself as a kind of the British family, with a kind of notion, well, he's sort of Christian, but there's not much emphasis on that, is the thing that makes us what we are, the thing that makes us great British, and it's embodied, represented in the royal family. Um, and again, this very different view of ceremony, in which ceremony becomes not an expression of royal power, but an expression of the royal burden. This again is this notion of, of service being an endless routine of empty ceremony. The, the, uh, the, business of the, wear, the, the business of the wearing of the crown at the state opening of Parliament, it's never been done. It's completely invented by George V, who hates it. And it gives him a migraine every time he puts it on. And yet he, he insists he goes ahead with it. He consults Asquith's cabinet and says, oh, we don't care. He does. And so you get this notion of ceremony as a kind of hair shirt. So somebody like the, the late Queen you know, was profoundly awkward, mainly in company. She really did not like it. And yet she puts herself through this. And the, again, her father, George VI, for whom he was a torment. And yet they feel obliged to do it. <coughs> and now, of course, we're in a world in which it's very difficult to see any meaning. And nobody's tried to explain what the coronation might mean. I mean, this is, this is the appalling thing. You've instead had a stream of royal trivia. You know, are we going to have the queen or is there a problem with the, the fact that the queen's, queen's scepter is made of ivory? I mean, absolute mere trivia, rather than any attempt to take... Remember, the coronation is, in one sense, is problematic. William IV thought there was no need for him to be crowned. He absolutely outraged... I think I seem to remember, I'm, I, I, may have, I, I know he intended to open Parliament just putting the crown on himself. I mean, he explained he was perfectly capable of putting a crown on his own head. He didn't need an archbishop to do it for him. <laughs> as early as 1830. <clears throat> Yeah. that we are the best yeah. country in the world mm. and that we make the best decisions. And I, mm. I, I think that, from what you then went on to say, yeah, it comes up time and time again mm. in the British psyche. Mm. But, but I'm not quite 
sure whether what you were saying at the beginning about the funding of the church in England was because we were saying we are the better church, better than the rest of the world. That's certainly, that is certainly what Burnett is saying. That's certainly what Burnett is saying. That's certainly what the Painted Hall at Greenwich is saying. And it's saying that this form of... Ra- what it's saying is we have a form of rational Christianity. We have a form of Christianity which accommodates reason, which accommodates progress. You know, not, no pio no no cursing progress. Absolutely the opposite. A church which is fairly and squarely on the side of it. Um, and uh, again, you see aspects of that you know, in, the, in the great Victorian debates over evolution and all the rest of it, which in some ways the church does align itself, but very quickly adjusts. Um, English conservatism is progressive, it's paradox. And there is, by the way, a very good reason that England thought it was best, because it won. And, and the, the English, remember, this is why, are we all familiar with the wonderful 1066 and all that? When does history stop? The end of the First World War, when we cease to be top nation. And it's taken over by America. And the whole American psyche, of, you know, America great, well, of course, it's now, it's now beginning to undergo some of our own self-doubts and whatever. But the, and the other, the, 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 there is the very great shift from the late 19th century of the, the Oscar Wilde of the uh, of the the thing that satirised um, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the Mikado, um, where where um, uh, amongst amongst people that Coco is going to execute are those who sing the praises of every age but this and every country but their own, and the hostility of the English intellectual to England. Um, which, is a, which becomes a peculiar disease, which has now taken over America as well, where it did not used to be the case at all. That's self-destruct. Um, um, but, but up to the 19th century, I mean, the, there's a very good reason for that confidence. Um, uh, uh, but I think it is also, um, and I really I do want, what I hope is, the, I mean, okay, I've been making several jokes because I think jokes are very important as means of understanding things. But what I would like you to take away is that notion that, the, that, that what Henry VIII did, despite all the horrible means by which he did it, would not have been possible without that fundamental confidence in the moral value of the English state. Um, and that seems to me to be, it's an unbelievably powerful idea. Uh, and the loss of that idea is a terrible one. Um, it, you know, one of the reasons for the, for, the, for the loss of that sense of social responsibility, which my generation was still brought up in, and we are largely responsible for destroying, um, was, was, was that sense of a profound obligation to this thing which is good and to your duty to be part of it. And citizenship is impossible without that notion. You cannot be a citizen and not, you know, you cannot be a responsible citizen without believing in the value of your country. You may think there are many things that need improving about it, but you've got to think that its existing constitution offers means of improvement. And that, that, that is what is remarkable about the English tradition. The, the, cons- the conservative tradition incorporates the idea of change. Disraeli is wonderful on this subject. I mean, his, his great Crystal Palace speech. Um, uh, is, is, is ex- which allegedly he delivers with two bottles of brandy <laughs> and going over three hours. They, they were made of sturdy stuff. <laughs> were they? Us wimps and a couple of glasses of Prosecco and feel tired. <laughs> There'll be a chance um, later on this evening at, at dinner to say a, to say a little more. So I'll, I'll just simply say now that um, you know, thank you so much, both well, uh, David, uh, principally and supported by Daniel, um, rooting us here to begin with in in Rome, in in Tudor uh, English Roman relations, but now in this final session, taking us right up to the present and, and just. I mean, I think leaving us with more questions than we started with, which is actually absolutely what a good, a good lecturer should do. So we're, we're absolutely uh, in your debt, and um, just for now, we'd like to thank you.
gentlemen, can I say you've already repaid it? Whatever debt there might be, I've enjoyed myself. And that is the most important thing. Thank you.